following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guests today are Brenda Scott and Nora Beatty, and we're talking about the Grey Bruce Healthcare Coalition and a poll that they are conducting on the privatization of healthcare and hospitals, especially our public hospitals. And this is a, a very important issue for many people across Grey Bruce. So, Nora and Brenda, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you to be here. Now, the Grey Bruce Healthcare Coalition is a, a new organization, um, kind of rose into people on people's radar in the last uh, month or so. But I understand there's a, a longer and deeper connection with um, a larger organization and uh, a much more long-term organization, the Ontario Health Coalition. Is that right? Yes, we're an affiliate of the Ontario Health Coalition, uh, which is a provincial organization, a, a grassroots movement, really, uh, that has been defending uh, Medicare in uh, Ontario for over 40 years. Uh, they have divided the province into about 20 different regions, and uh, Nora and I are co-chairing the Grey Bruce region. So what caused you to, to get involved with the Ontario Health Coalition? Perhaps I can start. Um, I I live in Meaford, and um, my uh, grandfather actually um, uh, handed out leaflets with Tommy Douglas's campaign when way back on the prairies in the forties and fifties. Um, and my father was a, a railroad engineer who, um, well, in his later career, was the Canadian chairman of the United Transportation Union. And I mentioned this because my father said to me about 25 years ago, if you kids, and I'm not, a, I wasn't a kid then, and I'm certainly not a kid now, but he said, if you kids don't uh, step up and fight for what your grandfather's generation and my generation fought for, you're going to lose all of it. And so over the years, I have seen, um, particularly in healthcare, uh, the move away from our public health care and the move towards more privatization. But when this particular government um, started to make the changes that it is making, uh, I became much more concerned. And I felt that I really, this was the time that I needed to honor my father's words and stand up and fight back. So I decided to uh, found out about the Ontario Coalition and uh, read a lot of their information and saw the referendum. They connected me with Brenda, and here we are today. So for you, it's and, it's and, it's more than just uh, an airy-fairy kind of um, exactly. intellectual exercise. It's personal. It is personal for me, and I think the, the whole issue of health care, and especially um, for people of our generation, the seniors, um, who remember what it was like before uh, Medicare, um, it's very personal because we know what the realities were before and we don't want our children and grandchildren to experience those realities in the future. Mm -hmm. In my case, I, uh, I live in Chesley. And um, so one of the issues that uh, kind of compelled my interest here is the continuing threat to the existence of our small rural hospital in Chesley. Um, we were, we, our ER was closed completely between October and December. It reopened in December, but remains on part-time hours, uh, weekdays, business hours, basically. And uh, so we uh, are in our community, we're very concerned about that. We recognize the um, relationship uh, between uh, the privatization move and the threat to other small rural hospitals, including ourselves. So that was one of the things that brought me uh, into this circle. I do, like Nora, I come from a, a labor family um, where Medicare was a very important um, component. And, um, I did work um, 
in for QP for a while uh, doing communications. And so there's a labor background there as well. When I was with QP, I actually worked with the Ontario Health Coalition in those days. I'm happily retired for a long time now, but my heart's still there. Well, I, I heard a good term for, for people who are retired but still doing their passions. It's called a re-engaged pensioner. <laughs> oh, I like that. You yeah, like that? Cool. I like that as well. <laughs> a new label. <laughs> right, right. But I, th- I think you make a couple of, of, of points wor- worth uh, repeating. The first is that um, people in this today, this day and age don't remember the the days when you got a bill from the doctor i'm old enough that i do remember Mm -hmm. my mother paying bills for the from the doctor um i was wasn't that old but i do remember them and uh i remember the when i got my first ohip card it was a piece of paper and you know it was it was a very very different world back then uh and it was it it was something that that uh, had to be fought for I mean, you uh, you speak of uh, Nora. You speak of the your your father handing out pamphlets with uh, Tommy Douglas. That's mm-hmm. it. That fight was nasty. That fight was yeah. nasty, you know. And it started really um, after the world after World War II. Mm-hmm. And uh, I see some similarities between the society then and our society. I mean, when the veterans came home, they had a lot of health care needs. Um, and there wasn't public health care, and uh, they didn't have the funds to necessarily get those needs met. And that's when the government of that day stepped forward and created a lot of these hospitals that are, in fact, Veterans Memorial Hospitals. Um, and they started to offer some form of public assistance to the veterans. But there was also a lot of social unrest in those days. There were affordability issues, housing issues. We have a lot of the similar problems today. And um, I am worried that uh, the people, especially the young people today, who are struggling to put a roof over their heads and food on their table, are now going to have to struggle to pay their medical bills in the not too distant future. Um, And everybody in my generation that I know can tell you stories of either family members or neighbors they knew who maybe spent 25 years paying off a medical debt or in fact went bankrupt as they do so often in the U.S. You know, it's funny. It's interesting you, you mentioned the U.S. because uh, a lot of people are commenting that we seem to be moving closer to an American-style healthcare system, and uh, so Nora and I both get a lot of calls from people um, on that very point. You know that they they don't want to go there, and they don't feel they had an adequate um, opportunity in the last election to um, vote on the issue because it wasn't put on the table during the election campaign. And so when people voted, they didn't know they might be voting to lose their local hospital or their public health care. Well, let's talk a bit about the, the hospital closures. I mean, Chesley is the one that is the, the probably the most, the most in the forefront of people's minds here, uh, simply because of, of uh, the experience that you've had over the last uh, year, I guess. The, the the closing least, of the yeah. ER, yeah, but there's it, it's it's not it, Chesley isn't alone. I, I was looking at the newspaper this morning, and the um, uh, the um, Halliburton Hospital Corporation is closing the ER at Minden permanently. And yes, they're, they're, they're doing they're, so as well with no consultation with any of the stakeholders or the town council. It, it they were given six weeks notice of that permanent closure on uh, June first of this year. And the CEO of the hospital says it's entirely due to funding. Yeah. It's entirely yeah. due to funding. The doctors were, are saying, hey, oh, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you know, and then we, we can look at, I think it's Wingham. It's also started closures. And down in Huron County, the North Huron Hospital has also been closed uh, intermittently over the winter. So it's, it's not... Um, it's not a remote and it's not an impersonal situation. It's not as if it's happening in down there in Toronto. No. I think <laughs> the figure that I've heard um, is that about 80 uh, small rural hospitals across this province have experienced some kind of closure, usually their ER, uh, for various lengths of times over the last couple of years. 
uh, and it's really escalated and become an issue in many small communities who really depend on their, their local hospitals for immediate care, but also to be stabilized in, in order to be transferred safely to a larger hospital center where they need specialist care. Sure. The small rural hospitals are a vital part of our healthcare system in Ontario. And Nuri's made a good point there about stabilizing and transporting patients to a regional hospital. If they're not stabilized um, before they're transferred, that affects things like survivability rates. And um, for many of the people in this area, um, th this is a really important issue. It's it's huge. Um, we're hearing rumors that um, Minden is closing on June 1st um, and that the next two hospitals potentially to be closed, uh, have their ERs closed full time, will be Chesley and Wingham. Mm. Well, we'll so, have to watch. So the fight is on. Uh -huh. <laughs> the fight is uh -huh. on. We're going to Queen's Park tomorrow to... Uh, take down our petition about the Chesley Hospital and talk about this issue. Sure. And that's the petition is separate from the, that's just the Chesley Hospital petition. I take That's it. the Chesley Hospital petition. That's yeah. separate from the poll. I mean, they're related, but they're, it is separate from the poll. Uh, how has uh, Mr. Byers, our MPP, responded to your, to the closure of the Chesley Hospital and your petition at all? He came to, we had a rally April 1st, and he attended the rally. We had a dozen speakers, and he was one of them. And uh, he um, said to the audience, I recognize that I have been put here to take forward your concerns to Queen's Park, and I intend to do that. I was sitting behind him at the time that he said that. And I got to tell you, the look on people's faces, they were not buying it. And... Mm true to form, <laughs> um, he uh, voted for Bill 60, um, and really without a mandate from the people in this area. And, and uh, so I did, clear, Bill... blog, and I did a little blog, I did a little blog entitled, shame on you, Rick Byers. <laughs> um, well, just to be clear, Bill 60 is the most recent legislation which just passed, which is called Your Health Act 2023, which is the one that is has really expanded the the role of private clinics within the Ontario health system. Correct? It, it, yes, it has, on May 8th. But it's yeah. interesting because, in fact, um, he could have established further private clinics without Bill mm -hmm. 60. Bill 60, in fact, goes much further than allowing the um, or furthering the privatization of our public hospitals. Um, it's changed the um, legislation so that uh, currently directors of um, hospitals or clinics uh, are um, public employees uh, uh, employed by the Ministry of Health, and therefore they're subject to the Freedom of Information Act. They have to do a public reporting and counting, financial reporting. In other words, there's some over oversight and uh, uh, a responsibility on their part. Now under Bill 60, anyone can be appointed just about to these positions. Uh, it could be a friend of the or or relative uh, of a politician. It could be a business, a corporation, uh, somebody who knows nothing about health care. Um, and they there is no um, because of that, their lack of connection with the Ministry of Health, they don't they're not um, subject to the freedom of information um, legislation. And um, they also are not going to have to uh, list uh, a list of every new um, clinic or hospital that opens so the public won't really know where they are and what they are and um, who owns them or, or really anything much about them. But the other most uh, problematic thing about that Bill 60 legislation is that it is deregulating uh, the um, certification and licensing and education qualifications and practicing regulations for a whole host of healthcare professionals, from nurses to doctors to lab technicians um, to almost anybody who works uh, within a hospital setting. So um, I don't know about you, but I, I want to know that the lab technician doing my CAT scan or my directing radiation at my body um, knows what they're doing and has been appropriately um, trained and, and 
is subject to some kind of oversight. We don't know what the new regulations are going to say. All we know is that they've been changed without consultation with those various organizations and groups. So that's very concerning. And I just wanted to go to just to, to, to step back a, a little bit. Um, and let's go back to that, uh, uh, Betty, that uh, Brenda, that, that blog you put, you were talking about. So you, you were saying that, that you thought Mr. Um, that Mr. Byers could have said something or done something, but he didn't. Is that correct? Yeah, basically. I mean, he he followed the party line, um, and he voted he voted first to um, uh, close debate, um, and then uh, shortly thereafter voted to support Bill sixty. And um, as Nora has mentioned, I mean the the ramifications of that um, bill are, are widespread and uh, very concerning, and will affect his constituents, all of the constituents in his riding. He didn't consult. He doesn't have a mandate from the people in this riding to privatize healthcare. Brenda, he did. Did he bring the petition forward to the legislature? No, no. We have a petition uh, concerning the uh, Chesley Hospital. Um, you know, we it goes back a little bit. Our our council, Aaron Eldersley Council, sent a letter to the premier and the minister of health asking them to prioritize uh, some assistance for Chesley to return to a full-time ER. Uh, the letter was never responded to or answered. So we had a petition and people in there in Eldersley have signed it. We've got it all stacked right here, ready to go tomorrow. And uh, Mr. Byers was asked as our MPP if he would present our petition in the legislature. And um, I guess he uses some of the same techniques as his boss because he didn't ever reply despite several requests. So uh, the petition is actually being presented by um, representatives from the other three parties. Mm, okay. Mr. Byers is sitting on his hands. <laughs> right, right, right. So that's, right. I said, shame on you, Rick Byers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That That's a, a, a very... Um, interesting um, development because um, it's just, it's puzzling. I'll say that. It's puzzling. It's puzzling. The, the other thing I, I wanted to, to come back to, um, and that maybe is Nora, in Nora's, what Nora was talking about, is that Bill 60 um, was passed by the majority government. And I'm going to presume it was on what they call a whip vote, which means that everybody has to vote in favor and follow follow the, the party line or risk being tossed out of caucus. And this is, you know, like it or not, that's the way that our government does work. Uh, a majority government does have the right to do that. But as you rightly point out, the law moves us away from transparency. Mm -hmm. Very much. Very much. Yeah. But if we want to use a really good example, the sunshine list, we know exactly what the salary of the CEO of Great Bruce Health Services and all the other health services in this province are because it's part of the sunshine list. We Would we know the, the, the uh, salary of, of someone who is um, um, heading a private clinic then? No, I don't think we would. But even more concerning, um, I think, is that... Uh, my understanding is, uh, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is um, that there will be contracts between the government and these private entities because the the, the government is providing the funds to uh, build the, the bare bones, the structure, uh, the buildings, um, or going to hand over perhaps some of our existing healthcare uh, buildings to the private entities to run. So there will be a contract, and um, uh, that contract will no doubt um, guarantee a certain percentage profit, because after all, if you're a private entity, you need to um, uh, have a certain amount of profit so that you can repay your stakeholders. That's that's the whole expectation um, in those situations. 
So there will be contracts between the government and these entities. Um, will we ever see those contracts? I don't know. Uh, there's no requirement, as I understand the legislation, that we will even have access through a freedom of information uh, law to, to see that information. Um, so it's really a total lack of transparency. Um, and I think it opens up huge possible conflicts of interest, um, possible corruption, um, which is very concerning. Mm -hmm. And un Another really one. undermines our private, our public system as well. Yeah. There's another um, issue where transparency becomes um, important, and that is in the delivery of some of the services, uh, such as cataract surgeries, hip surgeries, knee surgeries, which are proposed to be the first type of surgeries to take away from the public system. Um, Nora and I have heard many stories uh, from people who have had cataract surgeries. Uh, they agreed to go with a, a private clinic uh, because, uh, well, I know in one woman's case, she was afraid of losing her driver's license and she lives out of town. So she needed to get her surgery um, and she was referred to a private clinic. And she believed that the premier had said, you pay with your OHIP card, not your credit card. That's a, that's a somewhat deceptive statement because the OHIP pays for the, you know, the the exact procedure, the seven minutes that they're actually doing this, but uh, it doesn't cover everything at the medications, the use of equipment, the use of supplies. Um, so, I mean, I've talked to people who went down thinking they were getting their cataract dealt with under OHIP, who then subsequently ended up with $5,000 in debt. That's not transparency either, you know, because they didn't know, they didn't understand and it's massively increased their debt. So how about what's gonna happen when someone, when they start applying this to hip surgeries, which tend to run around $50,000, people could start losing their homes. <laughs> I mean, I think the experience in other provinces is very telling. Um, yes. And that, that, the, the other provinces have already experienced overbuilding, overbilling, upselling, extra costs, um, the BC government, has been in court fights, uh, battles with the Cambie um, surger sur surgeries um, for the last 14 years. And in fact, uh, two lower BC courts upheld um, the government when they said that, you know, they were operating outside of the Canada Health Act. And in fact, over billing, double billing, doctors were working in both the public and the private system, which is not allowed under our Canada Health Act. Um, and just most recently, the um, Supreme Court refused to hear Canby's appeal, Dr. Day's appeal, because he's, they, they said um, that the lower court's decisions were correct, that, that they were in fact infringing on the rights uh, of the Canada Health Act and that certain things had to stop. Um, so there's been lots of examples really across the country of, as well as internationally that have proven that um, private clinics and hospitals uh, result in fewer staff in the public system and much, much higher costs to the patient and to the public. I thought I saw some numbers out of Quebec in the last month or so, which um, have suggested that, that um, private clinics actually do um, cost a far a lot more than pro than the mm -hmm. public system, um, and Quebec is all is always ahead of the curve on a lot of these issues. But yeah. they are they have said, no, hey, just a minute, <laughs> we got we got to take a look at this because it's costing us all more when we use the private system. And this goes back to your your comment. Um, I think it was uh, it was you, Nora, who said that that it's uh, when you have a for profit system. It, it satisfies the shareholders first, as That's opposed right. to the public good. That's right. And, and let me let me just clarify something as well. Um, and that's about our our hospital system. It is a uh, every hospital in Ontario is a non profit corporation, as opposed they're not a for profit corporation. They're a non profit corporation, and that requires them to uh, plow any excess back into the system itself. And if they're in there, or at least come up with a balanced budget, 
and then, but a for-profit system requires that shareholders, as you said, be satisfied first. Yes, I, I, I believe that's true. And I think the promise of our Canada Health Act uh, is that uh, a patient, a person in Canada has access. So access is universal based on need, regardless of where you live, whether it's a small rural community, an urban center or a far north center. Regardless of where you live, you have a right, it's like a patient's human rights um, bill, uh, you have a right to care, not based on ability to pay. And I think it has been proven time and time again that through the private clinics, um, you may jump the, jump the line, you may get your surgery faster, and I know that's important to people. But the only people who are going to jump the line are the people who are going to be able to pay. And it's been proven that doing so does not remove the stress and strain or the wait lists in the in the public system. That's often the argument for the private system. All of the studies have shown that, in fact, the wait lists grow longer. Um, I don't want to belabor the point, but there there is a good example in Saskatchewan uh, where that, in fact, happened. Yes, and I think the evidence is from my own experience. The evidence goes back decades, and and is yes. true in other countries. It it's 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 not something that is really up for discussion. Um, a two tier system or a privatized system doesn't do anything for wait lists at all. And um, once once we get that two tier system and these private clinics and hospitals, it becomes almost impossible for the. Uh, federal government, for instance, to oversee and or provincial government to bring it back to the public system. I mean, when you think of the um, uh, the uh, the problems that BC had in controlling over a period of 14 years, a battle in the courts um, to rein in the um, acts that were occurring outside of the Canada Health Act um, legislation. Uh, it's very telling um, that once once these private clinics are operating, um, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to get back to a public system or a system that, in fact, honors uh, what our society in Canada has uh, believed in and, and the public has wanted uh, for decades. And once our smaller hospitals are um, eliminated, um, you know, if you look at this as strictly a business model, um, so any business, when it comes into an area, you'll often see them buy up the smaller competition so that they have more business and people have less choice. And that's kind of the business model that seems to be in play here. Um, and um, that's why when we have our referendum at the end of the month, um, we're asking people, it's a simple ballot, <laughs> and uh, it uh, just says, do you want our public hospital services to be privatized to for-profit hospitals and clinics? And it's a yes or no answer. So people who come to the poll to vote, they can disagree with us, and they can check uh, yes on their, their ballot if they want, or they can check no. So it is a choice for them, and it's a secret ballot. Um, to vote. They just have to be 16 years of age, resident of Ontario, and they sign a pledge not to vote twice in the same, uh, in this poll. Um, mm. And so that's the process that's coming up on the 26th and 27th. Well, we're, we're going to, we're going to um, take a break very shortly and we'll come back to that because I wanted to, uh, in fact, I just got the word in my ear, we can take a break. I do want to get into the nuts and bolts of the vote. So uh, that's absolutely great. So what we'll do is we will take a break, a short break, and we will be back. Friends, I'm David Chairman. This is Politically Speaking. And yep, we got a lot more to talk about. <laughs> This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. This is Rogers TV. Johnny wanted to go back home. It was a thousand kilometers away. They forced him to go to the Indian restaurant to school. 
More than 150,000 of us children had to go. They wanted to change us. Our Father in heaven, Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Kill the Indian and the child. It's been called cultural genocide. I survived residential school. My brother Johnny did not. Chani Wenjack was one of thousands of children who died due to Canada's residential school system. More than 80,000 survivors and their families still live with its legacy today. Welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm David Sherman. My guests are Brenda Scott and Nora Beattie of the Grey Bruce Healthcare Coalition. And we're talking about the poll that they are holding at the end of May um, about the privatization of public hospital services. And um, actually, I did want to ask a question of Nora, because as you were talking about the small rural hospitals and the, you know, what's going to happen, I do know for example, that um, Meaford Hospital has, the, the Grey Bruce Health Services has put a multi-million dollar eye surgery suite into Meaford Hospital. What's going to happen to that? Well, I haven't heard anything um, too much about that, um, but I think the current changes have caused my mind anyway to um, have some questions. Um Within Grey Bruce uh, Health Services, a while ago, the decision was made for each of the smaller hospitals to become a center for one particular area. And Meaford's area was going to be cataract surgeries and the colonoscopies uh, are slated to move out of our hospital. And I forget the other local hospital that they're going to. Um, so if we're a center for cataract surgeries, um, how are we going to compete with the new private hospital, which is one of three new hospitals, private hospitals, uh, being or, or clinics, the euphemistically the, the uh, Ford government prefers to refer to uh, these private hospitals as private clinics. Uh, there is a new cataract surgery clinic opening in uh, Waterloo sometime in the fall. There's three new new ones. I think the other one, one other is in Windsor, and I think the other one's in Ottawa, but I'm not sure. So we, for a long time in the Meaford area, have had to travel long distance to either London or to Waterloo for various treatments, which our hospital does not deal with. Um, so I ask myself, a new big cataract center in Waterloo, is Meaford going, patients going to be suddenly referred there? Um, to meet some kind of quota or contract obligation that, that may be had with, with that uh, hospital. Um, and if we do start to have people going there as opposed to being referred to Meaford, what will happen to that, uh, that cataract center? Um, or I guess my suspicious mind, and I admit that this is all conjecture, um, but, you know, when one doesn't have concrete information from the politicians, uh, my mind and other minds go to conjecture and become suspicious. Um, and I wonder if, in fact, down the line, will Meaford's Cataract Center be sold to a private entity to take over and run and operate? Because uh, once the other surgeries, such as colonoscopies, are completely removed from our hospital, the more services you remove from a local hospital, the less reason there is to fund and keep that small rural hospital open. Um, and our lab hours have already been cut due to staff shortages to uh, half days. Um, so, so there are questions in my mind, but again, I want to emphasize, I have no concrete um, information and I don't want to start rumors, but I think it is fair when you don't have the whole story um, that you start to wonder. We've had people uh, contact um, and, and ask questions like, 
um, in the small rural hospitals in this area, there's been a tremendous amount of local fundraising to pay for things um, like, uh, you know, new equipment, um, upgrades and such. And people are now asking, well, if they privatize our hospital, what happens to all the stuff that was bought with our money? <laughs> and people are starting to question that, like, is... Uh, is that going to be kind of a, a yard sale for private companies to come and buy up all that equipment? Um, it, it, it is a, an important question. The, the fundraising that has gone, gone on has certainly been a demonstration of the commitment of this pe the people in this area to their hospitals, and they want some answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether either of you remember the days um, back Probably well, it's, it's over twenty five, probably twenty five years ago, when hospitals were consolidated. Same questions were asked. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there may be there may be some lessons that uh, we need to learn relearn. I know that uh, I believe it was about thirty five years or thirty years or twenty five years ago. There was a um, a threat to the Mayford Hospital being closed, and the community rallied and fought and managed to keep it open. Um, I fear that we may be going into another situation. Um, who knows? We'll have to see. I do know that um, some of these private entities are currently operating and using the equipment in uh, a public hospital. There's the example of uh, the Riverside Hospital in Ottawa, which is a big hospital. Uh, but in February of this year, they did open a, uh, were allowed through a contract to have a private, I believe it's cataract surgery. Um, and uh, they work on weekends uh, in the Riverside Hospital using their ORs. Instead of the government funding the public system to keep those ORs open longer than uh, an eight-hour shift in a day and on some weekends, um, and there are some permanently closed ORs across the province that if the government were to fund those, re um, they could clear the backlogs at much uh much less uh, cost than going to pay for private entities. Okay. Okay. It brings up the question of um, the understanding that some of the shortages, including nursing shortages, but uh, other shortages, OR uh, time, uh, some of these uh, are to a certain extent artificial. They've been created by the current government. Uh, nurses, for example, um, you know, their wages were restricted under Bill 124, which was an insult to every public servant, but as, especially to nurses. Uh, they're currently trying to negotiate a new contract and the government left the table. I think their contract is going for arbitration at the end of the month, so there may be an answer soon. But um, there's certainly a lot of layers to this question. I think back to John Snobellan saying, you know, the best way to deal with some of these situations, he was dealing with education, but he said, let's create a crisis. And then we come in with the answer. <laughs> After you get people all upset and worried, you come in with your answer. And uh, that seems perhaps to be very similar to the pattern that's being followed now. Well, let's move on to the actual ballot, the the <laughs> voting that you're doing, because um, now um, I think Brenda, you 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 had a copy of the ballot that you right there yes. uh, that you read from. That's it. So it's a very simple piece of paper. It is, and you and you put it in the in the ballot box. And uh, who's going to count the these ballots? Uh, we're going to have a central location for counting, and we're uh, having scrutineers, so it won't be the people that are on the poll that do the counting. Um, it will be um, other scrutineers from within the community. And when um, the ballot we'll count in each, sorry, we'll count yeah. in each uh, region, and then we'll combine all those. We're all going to take them to Queens Park, and there will be they will then release the uh, figure total figure for the province. Sure. We'll also be able to get a um, account which, uh, for the local Grey Bruce area, um, which includes online ballots that are that are conducted. Yeah. So people right now can vote online. Uh, you just have to go to www.publichospitalvote.ca. Uh, um, sometimes there is a problem with using that site, uh, but that is an option. And um, 
if you do have trouble, you can always go to uh, one of the uh, polling stations we have, and I believe we have around 41 across Grey Bruce. Uh, there are inserts in leaflets which are being distributed that list where these polls are, are located. Um, and I think that uh, if you're out and about on the 26th and 27th of May, you won't uh, you won't be able to miss them because they're going to have signs and vote here and um, they'll be quite visible to people so they can just stop and drop in. Well, I just noticed I just had a look at the there's a map on the Ontario Health Coalition website. They're actually kind of a cool map because it'll you can zoom in on your local area. Yeah. And and you yeah. can see them now. It's not entirely up to date, but it's it's awfully close. And they say it won't be final until the twenty fifth. <laughs> um, so you know, because I think new places are always coming up. But I'll just read you very briefly uh, what I found on the map, and that was the Rockford Restaurant, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Harrison Park, Alexandra Park, Great Bruce Health Services. That's an interesting uh, place to do uh, polling. That's actually on the sidewalk on 16th Avenue. Okay. Okay. That's good. <laughs> but you'll be able to find it because it'll be right near Grey Bruce Health Services. It's right opposite the emergency entrance to uh, the Old Sound Hospital. Yeah. But right. it's, on, it's on municipal property, and we've had to get insurance and permits in order to use municipal property for these polling stations. Yes. Sure. Uh, let's hope the weather's good. Uh, I just I'm praying for it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's another one at the circle uh, in front of the Circle K at uh, right at uh, Kitty Corner to the LCBO. Yeah. Um, and the Parquet across from Tim Hortons. Yes, that's a good some... location for a Saturday morning. We couldn't get into the market, but it's yeah. just down the way from the market, so we expect to have that traffic. Yeah. And in Meaford, you've got uh, ENR's bulk bin. And uh, outside the Dollarama, mm -hmm. and uh, Meaford Hall, and mm -hmm. the, the LCBO. On the sidewalk. <laughs> On the sidewalk. <laughs> the of sidewalk. course. Of course. Yeah. And in Thornbury, I see uh, two locations, or three, the food land in Thornbury, the sidewalk um, across from the Thornbury Bakery, and uh, at Thornbury Market. Yes. So. That it's Thornbury great. Market is actually an advanced poll. It's because the market opens this Sunday, the 21st. So we'll have the poll there. And we were at the Katy Market uh, yesterday, and we'll be at the Katy Market next uh, Tuesday morning as well. Well, great. Well, gee, there'll be a lot of people at Katy Market. I, I There were a lot of people there. We have three people staffing the poll, and we needed three people. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and we have calls from Tobermory to uh, Ripley. <laughs> um, can we have a lot, a lot in Kincardine, a lot of activity, and a lot of volunteers there. And Nora's area is very well looked after, and um, so people should be able to uh, find or get to a poll fairly easily. I wish we could have done every community, but I think we've got a pretty good mix. Eugenia Garage Thirteen has a poll there. Uh, so we're trying to get out into the rural areas as well as the urban areas so people don't have to travel far. Uh, and we love, we've put them on busy road areas as much as we could so that uh, when people are driving by, they can just pop in and, and vote. Sure. What about uh, places like Sobble Beach? Have you got that covered as well? Yes, we've got. Uh, we're in the community center at, Cob at uh, Sobble Beach. Um, and that poll will have slightly different hours because the community center is um, booked in the on the, in the mornings on the Friday and Saturday. So there we'll run the poll from uh, 1 p.m. to 9. So we'll just extend mm -hmm. it out the other end. But yes, sure. it'll be at the community center. Well, it's it's uh, you're you're really doing this on a grassroots basis, aren't you? I were exactly. highly dependent on volunteers. Everybody is a volunteer. Um, and I'd like to just put in a plug right now that we, we do need more volunteers to help staff the, the polling locations. And there is training available and you won't be left alone. Uh, we will only operate a poll if there are two people uh, to assist with it. And as I say, in some locations, if we have enough volunteers, there may be three people working the poll. Um, so if anybody is interested, they could contact, uh, actually, can I give the Grey Bruce uh, email? Absolutely. Yes. 
So please send either Brenda or I um, uh, an email at uh, graybrucecountyhc at gmail.com. And uh, we'll get your email. If you tell us where you live, one of us will respond and we'd be more than happy to list you as a volunteer and uh, give you some training about how to go about doing this. You pick your hours, whether you want a two hour shift, a three hour shift, what day you want. Um, and uh, we're sure that we can accommodate you. Sure. It sounds like it's a, it's a real opportunity to do some, some grassroots um Information gathering. Yes. yes. Really, really grassroots information gathering, the likes of which we don't see very often. Well, we're not going to go away after the uh, referendum. I mean, it's a, it's kind of step one, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be a lot more word about grassroots <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, ongoing as well. Yeah. Well, because, because for you, um, Brenda, it's a... Um, it's a personal issue. It's your community that we're talking about here. It's, you know, yes, you're talking about right. your own hospital in Chesley. Yes, that may, that does make it personal. Um, and, you know, I'm also a resident of Great Bruce and, you know, well, I think everybody here deserves a say. I, I guess there's an issue around a democratic issue as well. Like um, in most democracies, uh, the, people who are elected are given their mandate or their direction from the people who voted. Um, and that's not really what happened here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's another issue there that, that is of interest. Yeah. Sure. Unfortunately, the, you know, the mandate that the Ford government has uh, was won by having 18% of the eligible voters in the mm -hmm. province um, only 18%. Uh, many people didn't vote. Um, so they have chosen to interpret their number of uh, MPPs as a huge mandate and are making a number of changes across the province based on that assumption. When in fact, um, a very large proportion of this province um, does not agree with many of their decisions. And, and as I keep saying to people, you know, when I hear uh, Premier Ford say that you will only ever vote with your O hip or um, pay with your O hip card. It sounds to me like what he said about the green belt. Um, I will not touch your green belt. There are just some things being said that are contrary to the actions that are happening today. Mm -hmm. Now I want to, um, and maybe um, one of you can tell the story of what happened. Maybe that's your story, Nora. What happened at Central Place when this this uh, vote was held? That's a very interesting story, I thought. You know, it was a very touching time for me. Um, uh, one of the residents of Central Place, which is a retirement home, uh, contacted me after they saw an article um, I had submitted to the Sun-Times and was very interested in um, having uh, the people uh, in that centre uh, being able to vote, and many of them are disabled and unable, would be uh, too too fragile or frail that they would not be able to go out into the community. So we had a poll there last um, Saturday, and uh, 49 of the residents did vote. And um, you know there were some dentists among among the group, and and uh, some doctors even, um, uh, and. Uh, all of them had a story about their early years or um, with with not having Medicare um, and were all worried about their children and grandchildren's future and the effects of, of these changes on them, as well as the effects on, on themselves. Um, uh, seniors have many health issues and um, you never know when that's going to happen, but young families with children have many health issues issues too and need help from time to time uh, so it was a very moving uh, three or four hours I spent there conducting the poll um, and the um, uh, it was Bob Avis who was a retired um, 
pharmacist who who helped set the whole thing up and he organized some of the the residents to be volunteers um so you know it it, it was a perfect example of you're never too old to volunteer and become involved when you believe in an issue and when it touches your heart and so they voted from their heart and they voted from their lived experience with healthcare. Well, it's great that they did because it's an inspiration to all of us to uh, mm -hmm. get out and act. That's right. And also it's a demonstration of their desire to care for um, the the generations to come. Yes. Because it's obviously more than one generation. It's their children, their grandchildren, and even perhaps their great-grandchildren. One of the disheartening things from some people that I've heard throughout this campaign is they seem to, some people, I don't know how many, but it's disturbing to me when I hear comments like, um, well, I can afford to pay and I don't mind paying because I don't want to wait anymore and I'm in pain. And while I can empathize and sympathize with their pain and the long wait, um, I don't want to become a lean and mean society where the only focus is I can afford to pay and that's all I'm worried about. Um, I think we have to look after the future generations and our children and grandchildren. Um, and we have been a kind, caring, compassionate society. And I hope that as a society, we don't lose sight of those values because that is the basis of our um, health care act. One of the key uh, provisions of our healthcare system has been universal access. And I think what Nora was just uh, alluding to um, speaks to that. You know, um, for those people who can't pay, um, they deserve as deserve health care as much as the rest of us. Exactly. Uh, and it's really important to maintain universal access. Yeah, it's interesting you, you would you frame it that way because um it's easy to say well i can pay for it mm -hmm. but the principle which you mentioned before is is that um people who are in the greatest need go to the head of the line the the technical word is triage mm -hmm. and yes. you've experienced triage if you've been to the er and you're waiting to see the doctor and all of a sudden a car accident comes in mm -hmm. and i've been in that position on many occasions um and you know it's okay <laughs> you know it's it's not as if we we don't we don't want the care it's not as if the care won't be provided it's that at this moment we there there is someone who we have, we have to put ahead and actually the hospital staff are are pretty good because you'll often get i'm sorry we apologize but yeah and you know it's it's not about me it's about somebody who's uh, had a cardiac arrest or someone who has been badly injured in a car accident, and they have to deal with that, and they have to deal with it quickly. Yeah. Uh, so it's a uh, the stories are legion. Yeah, a, a lot of what we're doing too um, does show respect for the healthcare professionals that we that we depend on. Mm -hmm. um, they're not the ones causing the problem. Although you'll hear that that messaging that goes out, oh, all those nurses, they don't want to work. That's not the case. They've been treated very unfairly. Uh, there are very many outstanding labor issues, wage issues. Um, people were uh, working under severe stress. And that needs to be addressed. And it's not just nurses, by the way. I mean, it's all of the healthcare professionals um, in the system, physios and people doing x-rays and um, great respect for all of them. Mm -hmm. I think we're the other thing to remember too is that the 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 system has been pared down over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to look at our our optometrists mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, the issues they have had. Uh, you mentioned physiotherapists that, yeah, they are no longer and haven't been covered for many years mm -hmm. other than in a hospital setting and in a uh, a private clinic, which is subsidized or paid for by OHIP and then um, and, and other professions. Uh, so it's uh, which is one of the reasons we're going to get we're going to get eventually dental dental care. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it isn't covered, but it will be eventually. So it's a it's a very fluid situation but i think you make you're very right to make the point that that we have to look at the system itself and 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 i have had a doctor say to me um 
and it was a specialist. He said, I would love to see more patients. I would love to do more surgeries that I know need to be done, but there's not the money. Mm -hmm. Or there's not the OR time, which is, is another oh, way of saying there isn't well, the money. The funding, he, is, he was referring yeah. to the funding of OR time. Yeah, that's right. So. Another way it affects uh, uh, doctors, for example, um, in small communities and uh, larger as well, I guess, um, having a functioning ER um, is represents a part of their income. Mm -hmm. So doctors um, who have been working within the system have had their income reduced as well. And if you, you want to talk about hiring new doctors, but you want to also take into mind that we need to retain the ones we do have. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's another issue that needs to be brought forward. I yep. think for small rural areas as well, how many people will want to move to a community if they don't have a hospital? Right. Um, and as Brenda just mentioned, how many doctors will be attracted to practice here if they can't um, also learn and work and grow professionally by working a shift in the local hospital ER? Um, I think the the threat of possible closure of either parts or all of these rural hospitals um, is very um, concerning for the whole communities uh, that we live in, the whole areas that we live in. Um, With the question of healthcare um, and hospitals, there's a lot of big money in play. And for example, as Nora mentioned, um, you can see in, in smaller communities, it's easier to see that your hospital is a very important part of your economy. Um, not only um, in terms of the existence of the, the hospital itself, but because unlike in larger centers, uh, you know everybody who works there. Uh, they're your friends, they're your neighbors, and their income contributes to the um, benefit of the community. And uh, so, communities will be harmed by these types of um, actions that we're talking about. For sure. For sure. It will be, it'll be very interesting to see when do you anticipate the results will be um, made public? There'll be an announcement um, on the Tuesday, I believe, following the, the closure of the polls. Uh, we'll be counting up until uh, midnight on the Sunday, the 28th. And then uh, the results will be announced publicly on, on Tuesday, I believe, Brenda. And then on Wednesday, uh, following, uh, the, I think it's the 31st, uh, there will be a um, demonstration at Queen's Park uh, and speakers um, and uh, more publicity and media then. Uh, but as we mentioned before, that's not the end of this. This is really the beginning. And there will be other strategies and um, things that the public will be made aware of where they can show where they, they stand on this, this issue and put uh, increasing pressure and uh, continual pressure, we hope, on the government to change direction. Well, I want to thank the both of you, Brenda Scott and Nora Beatty of the uh, Grey Bruce Healthcare Coalition, to bringing, making us aware of this important issue. And I hope you'll get out and vote in this poll uh, and express your, your opinion, whatever it may be. And uh, so if you're able to volunteer, um, the, I'm certain that uh, they'd be glad to have public support. If, uh, if you go to Ontario Healthcare Coalition, uh, Google it, you'll find them and you'll get, be led to the Grey Bruce uh, Healthcare Coalition. Uh, Nora, and Betty and and Brenda, thank you so much for for being a part of politically speaking. And uh, who knows, we may talk again. Thank you, thank you for having us. us. <laughs> and thank you, friends, Great. for being a part of politically speaking. I'm David Sherman, and yep, we'll talk again. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media.
he's, uh, you know, taking up some space. And a, just a perfect shot. And we got a tie ball game. It's nice low shot right around. Right around for and what had happened to him is nothing short of a tragic story. I got a call from my friend. He says, yeah, his wife killed him. She told him I'd kill this guy.